Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order the Cabarrus County Schools Board of Education business meeting for tonight, Monday, October the 8th, 2012. And now we'll move into our uh, presentation of colors, our opening ceremony. And at that, at that time, I'd like to mention all those that are here tonight from the Mount Pleasant Junior High School Air Force ROTC unit. Uh, commander is Cadet Major Caitlin Culp. We also have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alex Carricker, Lieutenant Emily Shepard, Cadet Major Allison Shepard, and the cadets are being led tonight by Lieutenant Colonel Malcolm Smell of the United States Air Force Retired and Chief Master Sergeant Kevin McLaughlin from the United States Air Force Retired. Would you all stand with me for the presentation of colors? I still get emotional every time I hear our national anthem, thinking about, you know, the price that was paid for us to be able to gather here this evening and have, have our say individually. Anyway, we thank the Air Force ROTC for being here and for that wonderful ceremony. Now we're going to move on now to the setting of the agenda. Board members, we've had our agenda for a week or so, and uh, so I need a motion that the agenda will be approved as presented. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, I just have a, a, point, a point of order or a, a question as to why we could not ask that we move 5.1 <clears throat> recognitions to this, the first item, so that those individuals do not, are not required to stay. Is there a reason for that? We told them not to come at 6, but to come at 7 or 7. Oh, thank you. And I was worried also, about them. And, <laughs> and, and, and also, we had, we had advertised it too, Ms. Monnett, for 6 o'clock. The, we had advertised the public hearing for 6 o'clock, okay? 
All right. Do I have a motion to the agenda be set uh, approved as presented? So moved. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. The motion carries. Uh, the meeting is in session. And our first order of business tonight is the public hearing uh, on the proposed realignment of Cox Mill Elementary School and W.R. Odell Elementary School, the attendance boundaries. And so I call for a motion at this time that the public in, uh, hearing, the public input, uh, a motion that it be approved. Uh, I have a motion. The public hearing be opened. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. We're actually, we're into the public hearing portion now. All right. Now, for the public hearing, the speakers, our first speaker tonight uh, is Miss Kathy Rosser. She's a Cox Mill PTO parent, I believe. And you can come on to the podium, and Mr. Kirk will make sure the mic is on. And one thing that I failed to mention earlier when I was making the announcements, and that is, if you, you have a speaker, and when she finishes or he finishes, if you would, please hold your applause until all of the speakers have spoken. That will cut down on disruptions, and I'd appreciate it. Okay, Ms. Uh, Rosser, we're ready to hear you, and the clock starts. Don't forget, you got a little clock in your left right there to show you on your, okay. I think it'll be, yep, I see you'll it. see it. And when okay. it gets on the orange or the yellow, that means you got 20 seconds. And when it gets on red, that means your time's up, okay? Got it. Thank you for being here, and I'm ready to hear what you have to say. Thank okay. you. I want to thank you for offering a public hearing regarding alleviating <laughs> the overcrowded conditions at Cox Mill Elementary and W.R. Odell Elementary. I am a parent, a PTO board member, and a substitute teacher for Cox Mill Elementary, and have a unique perspective of the gro school's growth over the past five years. With a current enrollment of 1,282 students, the choreography involved in navigating through the hallways to get to the cafeteria and specials classes, using the restrooms, sharing playground space, etc., is quite impressive. I am grateful for the opportunity that Dr. Sane offered to myself and our PTO president, Derek Todd, to help her understand the overall effects and concerns of our student population and Cox Mill families. After reading through the phase one recommendation of moving 139 students, primarily those families that live east of Derrida, over to Carl A. Fur Elementary, and upon reflection, feel this is a good start in alleviating the overcrowding issues that Cox Mill Elementary currently faces. With that being said, it seems that moving forward, there are at least three key points that need to be addressed. First, what is the progress of designating land and getting the county commissioners to vote and initiate the process? As I understand the process, once a site has been designated and purchased for the new elementary school, it will take approximately two to five years to complete the construction. With phase one going into effect for the 2013-2014 school year, it appears that this solution could turn from temporary into long term <coughs> if there has not been a tract of land designated and or purchased. And my understanding is that no such action has taken place to date. Second point is, is this redistricting solution adequate to address the need to reduce the number of students at Cox Mill? The county will be allowing rising fifth grade students to be grandfathered at both schools. According to Dr. Sane's initial recommendations, Cox Mill Elementary is needing to lose at least 200 students. I believe that those being redistricted understand in some ways that this is a difficult decision to make, but if it's not even nearing the predicted minimum, minimum number of students that need to be realigned, is it truly the best remedy? I have spoken with and heard from some of these families that they may seek a new residence within the new boundaries, which would leave Cox Mill in the same predicament we are currently facing. Add to this data that Dr. Zane included in her research that the county is predicting that 167 new students will be enrolling at Cox Mill Elementary over the next two years. It seems that Cox Mill hasn't really gained any breathing room and will in fact be back to the current overcrowding situation much sooner than a new school can be built. My third point, how quickly can and will a plan be initiated to identify and secure land for a new school and initiate the process of building a new school? It has been mentioned in the board meetings over the past few months of a need for a new middle school due to the capacity of the current middle schools, in particular Harris Road Middle School, which is currently at 97% capacity. With enrollment at 1,106 students and a projected 291 additional students to be enrolled over the next two years, this would bring the percentage of capacity up to 122%. It seems that a site and construction timeframe should be in place now for this project congruent with the elementary school 
in order to accommodate the population growth for that age group as well. Otherwise, those families with fourth and fifth grade students, like myself, at Cox Mill Elementary and Odell Elementary, will be in this exact situation with our children when we get to Harris Road Middle School, with the likelihood of facing identical overcrowding challenges and possible temporary redistricting again. Again, I would like to reiterate that it is appreciated that the board is recognizing that action needs to happen. We just hope that for the sake of the students and families, recommendations reflect the data and will have an impact that makes sense for all. Thank you, Ms. Rosser, for your comments. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker that we have lined up is Jennifer Lightfoot. She's also an Odell parent. Uh, Ms. Lightfoot, if you're here. Okay, how about Robert Lightfoot, an Odell parent? Okay, our next speaker, Candace Williams. Uh, she's speaking on behalf of the residents of Pelham Point. Okay, so you're here. You have five minutes also. My name is Candace Williams, and I stand before you today on behalf of the residents of Pelham Point with children currently enrolled in Odell Elementary. My husband and I have four children in Cabarrus County Schools, a ninth grader at Cox Mill, a seventh grader at Harris Road, and fifth and third graders at Odell. Admittedly, when we first heard of the proposed redistricting, we responded emotionally. Our third grader has been at Odell since kindergarten. Our son has already established wonderful relationships with teachers at Odell, including the fourth and fifth grade teachers, as well as the staff and administration. That said, the concerns that my husband, neighbors, and I share are not just emotional. They are practical, reasonable, and thoughtful. We strongly believe that the proposed plan is not the plan in the best interest of our children. While we understand the need to prepare for growth, we believe that a different, less disruptive approach is required. If the true concern is future growth, we recommend you cap enrollment into Odell from our neighborhood for the next couple of years, allowing only currently enrolled families, which would of course include younger siblings not yet attending Odell, to finish their time at Odell. At minimum, I ask that all families, not just those with rising fifth graders, who may or may not have been at Odell as long as my child has, have the option to keep their children at Odell and provide their own transportation. Again, our son is a third grader who has spent his entire career at Odell. With the potential of adding two additional upper level classes and one additional lower level class, why should our child or any other child not have the option of completing his or her elementary career at Odell during this pivotal time in his life? While we appreciate the need to prepare for growth, this change impacts our children today and in the future. I believe we need to accommodate the children who are currently enrolled thus grandfathering them into their current school and in the long run look for the best way to accommodate for future growth. Dr. Sain stated that a new school would open up 800 seats. Meanwhile, we expect growth in the Boger area that may require us to pull some children back. Again, why are we pulling them for future growth while at the same time acknowledging that that same future growth may require these same children to move back down the road? During last week's board meeting, a good discussion took place about pulled permits and what that really means. Being pulled does not mean a house is being built tomorrow. And given the coming winter months, on top of an economy that while rebounding is not yet in full swing, we are looking at anywhere from six to 18 months or more before many of these homes will be built. And even then, we can only project how many children we can expect. But once again, our children will have already paid the price. This proposal has our son, who is in the third grade, move into a new school during his last two years of elementary school in response to projected or potential growth from, neighborhood, from the, our neighborhood over the next few years, at which time our neighborhood could, could be zoned back to Odell. At that point, our child has already lost out on his last two years of elementary school with friends he has had since kindergarten. Preparation for families who don't yet live in preparation for families who don't yet live in our neighborhood. My neighbors have four young boys, a kindergartner, a first grader, and two younger boys soon to follow. Based on this proposal, their kindergartner and first grader would be transferred to Boger with the very real possibility of being moved back to Odell in two or three years, only to have to establish relationships for a third time. Their younger sons face the real possibility of starting at Boger 
only to be moved back to Odell and also have to establish new relationships. To say this is disruptive to a family is an understatement. While I appreciate the goal of disrupting as few children as possible, when your child or children are among the few, you want options, and you do not want to feel as though your children have been chosen as the ones who are just supposed to take one for the team. I agree with our distinguished chairman when he said last week that we are all in this together. So let's make sure that what we do now is for the good of those students currently enrolled in our schools while we prepare for those we know will eventually come. Again, we ask that our children be grandfathered into Odell and that you cap enrollment for our neighborhood as needed and at the minimum allow us all the option to provide our own transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Our next speaker, uh, number five on the list, I believe is a third grader at Odell, Lanny Donaldson. And here comes Lanny. You may have to pull the mic down for her, if you will, Robert, so she can <coughs> talk for us. Get her a chair. <laughs> yeah, let's get her a, let's get her a stool there. We're going to get away for you so we can see you, Lanny. There you go. Hang on to me for a second. Let me chill. All right, we look forward to hearing from you. Hi, my name is Lainey Donaldson. I'm a third grader at Odell. And I don't feel like this is fair or right that I am being kicked out of my own school. I love Odell, and all my friends go there. I love my teachers. I'm also in the AIG program, and I'm also perfect attendance since the kindergarten. And this school is very important to me because my whole family went there. My great-grandfather, Foy Craven, was in the first graduating class at Odell, and my grandfather graduated there. My mom was the last eighth grade class to go there, and my sister was the last fifth grade class there. The Cravens also helped start the Odell community, and I'm wondering how the new people are taking my spot in Odell. I only have two more years at Odell, and it is making me sad, and I don't want to go to another school. My sister went to Odell and is now at Coxville High School, she, and she is in the 11th grade. I was excited about following her footsteps. My parents built our home on family land on Jim Johnson Road so that we could attend Odell. This is not fair to me. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Donaldson. You did a good job. Yes, you did. <laughs> okay. Thank you once again. Our next speaker is number six. It's uh, Jarkila Hunter, a Cox Mill parent, and she's on her way to the podium now. So, whenever you get ready, Miss Hunter, we're ready. The clock's on go. Thank you for this opportunity. My daughter is a third grader at Coxville Elementary. When my husband and I migrated from Virginia to Charlotte because of his job department closed, we sought out a home that will allow our children to attend a school with high achievements. My only request to my husband was to find a home that is close to the best school in Concord. Coxville is an A school. I have high expectations for my child to earn A's. I'm sorry, why would I want to send my child away from an A school? You want me to send my child to a school where in 2011, only 63% EOG was above proficient in reading for fourth grade, which my child will be attending next year, and 75% was math. Compared to Cox Mill, 86% EOG reading above proficient and 95% was math. If we're going to send our children to a school, please send them somewhere that's comparable with the math and English and proficiency as a top performer school. One may argue that one school may be better in various subjects. One can argue that the, there's a need for restructuring a school system, but I think no one can argue that moving kids has a positive impact. This type of redistricting is far reaching and not just simply affecting the schools, but it will negatively affect the routines of our family lives. Many of us choose to send our children um, to 
I mean, I'm sorry, many of us chose to send our children to Cox Mill, live near Cox Mill, and close proximity to the ease of access of town, my career, businesses, and our community. I stand before you again today, and please keep my child at Cox Mill Elementary. Thank Mr. you, Ms. Hunter. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, could we ask the speakers to please give their address um, and subdivision? Because some people are not. We, yeah, just, I, we, we have a map before us, and I'd like to kind of place you on the map. So, thank you. Okay. All right. Our next speaker <laughs> is Ms. Ann Lancaster, a Cox Mill parent. <laughs> And once again, as Ms. Furtenbaugh recommended, would you give us your address where you're at? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, like, once again, my name is Ann Lancaster. My daughter is a third grader at Cox Mill Elementary School, so I kind of share some of the, the two sentiments of the third graders that are at Odell. Um, I'm in a resident at Bexley Square at Concord Mills. Um, I'm at 521 Hydrangea Circle. That's where I'm currently at. I understand everyone is going to be ha is not going to be happy in this equation. But if Cox Mill is already almost 300 kids overcrowded, how would sending 139 students in these areas alleviate this issue? It's a small band-aid on a large wound. Unless we carry through with a more impactful re resolution with the way our area is growing, we will be revisiting this same issue for the next three years until the new school year, I mean, until the new school is built. I am proposing one split, one time. I propose we revisit sending a grade level over to the newer buildings on the old Odell Elementary School campus. We have a school year to figure out busing as well as how to appropriate funding to complete this project. Are there any other options similar that do not require redistricting until the new school is built? Again, moving 139 students is not going to be a long-term solution. Before the school year closes and over the summer, Cox Mill will regain a large percentage of this in new enrollment. The areas affected are not the areas that have the majority of the building permits. There are a large amount of housing starts in the Winding Wall and Christenberry subdivisions. What school will these students attend next year? If something is not done that is more impactful, we will be in the same boat at the end of the next school year. Then what will be next? More redistricting? Will we be any better off than Charlotte Mecklenburg school system if we continue to move our kids around year to year, school to school? Then, have we even thought about how this could affect Cox Mill with regards to diversity? Better yet, have we even considered how re redistricting affects the consistency of our school's educate or our students' education? If we do one split, one time, all these factors will be more carefully considered. In closing, one on behalf of my apartment community, I am asking that you reconsider this decision so our kids are not moved next school year. Please allow my third grader the opportunity to finish her career at Cox Mill Elementary. Again, I am stressing one split, one time. Thank you, Ms. Lancaster, mm -hmm. for your comments. And also, I have gotten letters. If y'all would like to consider, further consider my one split, one time proposal, if y'all want to later uh, on. You can give those to the board clerk, and okay. then she can send them down to us, right. Ms. Monroe. Okay. And uh, more, than, <laughs> more than likely, we've already got them, because I don't know how the other board members were, but I sort of got bombarded with emails but uh, okay thank you once again miss lancaster our next speaker number eight is uh, mickey wallace another cox mill parent and she's on her way to the podium thank you for being here miss wallace good evening i'm mickey wallace i'm the mother of luciana wallace who is currently attending cox mill in the first grade my husband and i have been residents of the twin creek development for the past 17 years I understand how difficult it must be in making decisions that could potentially affect the lives of numerous children. I am addressing you today not only as the mother of Luciana, but as a mother who shares a common interest with other parents in the Twin Creek development. We want our children to be able to complete the education offered to them when they first step through the doors of Cox Mill. Please note the following concerns that we have with Dr. Sain's recommendation to remove 139 existing students from the Dorada Road area. With less than 20 students coming from the established neighborhoods of Twin Creeks and Misty Wood, we feel the propo proposal will only be a very temporary solution. There are no new subdivisions or plans for new subdivisions on Dorada Road as this location is rapidly becoming industrial. 
I have spoken with many other parents and we feel removing our children only to make room for new enrollment from true growth areas is only going to leave Cox Mill in the same shape it is in today, if not worse. Our children have learned to trust and build relationships with their peers, teachers, and other school staff to form a tight-knit community. We as parents have learned to trust that our children will receive the exceptional learning opportunities guaranteed by Cox Mill, opportunities that are unmatched as demonstrated by the rank and test scores of Carl A. Furr. We feel the solution being considered is one that puts our children's education at risk while not solving the underlying problem. My request to all of the board members today is to please, please explore all other solutions, one of which is capping enrollment for the 2013-2014 school year. I ask you, is this proposal to rezone the Cox Mill School District the best solution we can provide for our children? Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Wallace. Okay, our next speaker is Lillian Ethani and Demary Jones. And I'd like to ask you to pardon me if I met, had a mispronunciation there. I'm not the best at names. Pardon? She's not here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Lillian L. Haney, uh, just to correct you. Um, I um, First, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to express my concerns regarding the redistricting. I am speaking for myself as well as for uh, Dean Marie Jones. We both have children at Cox Mill, <laughs> and um, I'm very touched at listening to Lanny because her words are the words that I hear from my little one, Alex, and Dee Marie's little one, whose name is Alex, almost on a daily basis. They know what's happening, and it's affecting them dearly. It's affecting every household. Uh, first, I'd like to express how I found out about this. I was sent a video link of the last meeting when Dr. Sane presented the idea to the board and the board gave her some options that we should look at. I specifically remember you because I sat behind my computer listening to your options and saying, that sounds like an idea. What concerns me the most is the ideas that you came up with one of them being, uh, someone on the board said, give the parents a choice. You said, add additional classes. Um, I'm not too sure how far that would have gone. But what concerns me is that hasn't even been brought out as a choice. They went straight to redistricting. And uh, like other parents have just stated, that we want all options. There's some questions that come to mind uh, with this redistricting, and I just want to lay the questions out. I'm sure that Dr. Sane will come forth and answer everyone's questions at due to, on due time. One, what happened to the suggestions with the board in the last meeting? Why are we not considering those options? Two, have you considered the stress that you're putting upon the families and the children that are in these schools? Three, the letter that we received stated that 139 students from Cox Mill would be transferred to Fur. Why are these students not given an option to go to Boger or vice versa? Why aren't the students from Fur getting, uh, from Odell given an option to go to Fur? Are the families aware of the fact that FER is now a Title I school? You are taking students from an honor school of excellence and transferring them to a Title I school. A parent just came before you and, ex and gave statistics of the grades that, uh, the, the reading and math levels. You're taking a student that is at a level a higher level in reading and math and transferring them to a school that is at a lower level. Yes, Ms. those L schools get... Yeah. I'm sorry, but your three minutes is up. 
I'm speaking for two. Did we have that on the agenda for two? I think we only had it for one, didn't we? It does say two. Okay, so you're doing both times. Okay, thank you. The clock didn't change. That's what threw me. Okay. Thank you. Has transportation been considered in the redistricting as well? What guarantees do these students have if you do decide to redistrict when the other schools start crying overcrowding this? Are we going to do another redistrict in the other schools? Our kids are not garbage that you could just kick around from school to school. If this is going to take place, we need to compare apples to apples here. You, if you're going to do it and you're going to take students that are at an honor school of excellence, then you need to find them a school that they could equally match up with that education level. Thank you for taking the opportunity to hear my voice. Thank you, Ms. Elhanny, for being here, and I apologize for the interruption. Mm -hmm. Okay, now our next speaker is uh, Dan Grunman. And Dan, I think you, you're speaking on behalf of the parents' <laughs> residents at River Ridge? Yes, uh, okay. River Ridge is in the north, uh, northwest part of the county. It's rural, one of the more rural areas. There's no growth in that area. Um, and um, and I, think, I think what you heard earlier is a real case for minimizing the number of students that get moved. There's uncertainty in the numbers of, of actual growth. We've heard that, that these recommendations are based on somewhat unverified data. We don't know how, actually how many contracts are actually being executed out there for houses. We know about permits. Um, and we don't know the demographics of, of where people are moving in with kids that won't enter the school system for a few years isn't fully considered because a lot of these, or some of these are starter home neighborhoods. So we, before we make decisions, we better make sure we know what data we're using. and. Um, we need to minimize the number that we move. It seems like we've taken a lot of students and just decided to move them and say, well, that'll hold us off for a while. That, that's the way this all appears. And in reality, there, you don't have to do this all at once. You can move a minimum amount of students, and you can see if the growth is really there and validate the data. I mean, why would you move more students than you absolutely have to? I know you don't want to go through this again and move the students. I understand that. But that's no reason. So why wouldn't you have a multi-year plan where you phase students over, you do in an organized and thoughtful manner? Um, we live up in the northwest part. There's no growth up there. I think it's the last place in the county in, in the redistricting plan that makes sense. There's no growth. There's not that many students. And some of this, there's a good number of those students are older and will be exiting the elementary school. We all go to Odell. We love the school. Um, and that's our community. The school is our community. We don't have a big neighborhood where we're central, you know. We're, we depend on the school, and that, that's the community for all these kids in the rural areas. The bus routes up there, you know, they pick up a few kids at a house and a few kids at a time. You go to the bigger neighborhoods, you know, it's a lot quicker. They get a lot of kids on and a few stops, and they fill up quickly. Our kids have a pretty long bus ride, probably not as bad as the ones right next to us in the Boger area. But it's going, to be, it's going to be worse than those kids. And those kids will suffer from having to probably be on a bus that meanders over into our area. There's a nice clear path from the Davidson-Sudbury Road uh, uh, areas right down past the farms down to Odell. So there's a nice transportation flow there. Um, the parents that live on the very f far western side of the county, they tend to work more on that side and as you go east they work more toward the others my wife and a lot of the moms in the neighborhood they struggle but they get to odell and they support stuff they're there supporting things and volunteering my wife can't make it to boger she's not going to be able to do it from davidson and get back to her job several of the other moms so she's going to not only hurt the students but you're going to lose parental support at both schools and you're going to hurt the schools the students and yourselves so I really want you to think about a phase plan. And I really think you should, the last place, you know, I know I'm defending my own area, but <laughs> the last place you want to impact is these highest impact kids, and that's up in this rural area. With the bus rides, 
but the fact that they depend on the community of the schools. So that's very important. I also think you should be a little more creative or try to be a little more creative and think about the impacts of both systems together. The Poplar Trails neighborhoods, if you look at and ones down there that go to Cox Mill, if you look at the growth down there, they're not going to be able to stay in that district. You know, eventually you're going to have to push them out. So did you consider what the future of that neighborhood is? Did you consider a place where you could move them with a group of neighborhoods over and then have more flexibility to manage between a Dell and Cox Mill? Because some of, the, some of those neighborhoods probably wouldn't mind as much going between those two schools. They're very similar in, in location. So I think there's a lot more thought that could go into our plan. Um, but, it, but, it, but I really, again, want to emphasize, don't move too many over and overcrowd Boger, you know, because if you look at your chart that didn't even include the number of folks in our area, you could have potentially 219 students just from these other areas that doesn't include the northwest part. That would put Boger over capacity, not even considering their own numbers, and um, then you have to move people back, and I'm sure you wouldn't want to do that, right? So, so think about that in your plan, too. The worst thing you can do is move too many students. And if you move a certain number and we find out that you didn't need to move them, that's not going to be fun either because there will be a lot, of, a lot of angry folks. But I do appreciate what you do, um, and hopefully you can get a new school book real quick right, next, right close to me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Drummond. You're right. I don't know how close it's going to be to anybody, but we're working on it, though. Okay, our next speaker is uh, David Hyatt. He's an Odell parent. David, you're ready to go. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Chairman, you, by the way, I live in the Wellington Chase subdivision, which is about a mile and a half from Odell compared to the six-mile commute we'd have to uh, Boger uh, should this recommendation come to fruition. Uh, I have two children that attend at Wellington, or I'm sorry, that attend at uh, Odell School. And tonight I'm coming before you hopefully, hopeful that this is not just a matter of procedure so that we can move on and get the vote on a recommendation that's already been decided. I really hope that you will listen to our concerns and our questions and make the effort to answer them for us before you move on with these recommendations. Uh, to make sure I stay within the time, I want to make sure I get my two big questions in for you and then tell you about the underlying number of questions and concerns that, that I have, feeling that there hasn't been quite enough transparency in understanding what's going on and perhaps not quite enough planning uh, for the future growth of our area as it relates to the entire school district. Uh, so first I'm going to ask you tonight, when this vote comes up, to please consider tabling it, thinking about the other options, think about letting us parents come and be involved in seeing those options and considering how it does affect us. Perhaps a few amendments to these recommendations could certainly help things go, move a lot smoother across all the communities. Let us understand more about the schools our children may be transferred to rather than just giving us the week's notice that we have. Matter of fact, some of us didn't quite get a week's notice because the information had to go out three times before it actually included our neighborhood. As a Wellington Chase resident, I'm also asking you to consider that if this vote does pass tonight and these recommendations are adopted, that you would consider grandfathering in all of the current students and capping the, 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 the enrollment at these schools so that we can rely on where we've chosen to live and the schools we've chosen to send our children to. Many of us sought out homes in the neighborhoods that would be served by these schools, and, and that's why we want to be there. It, it, it's hard to follow the third grader who stepped up here a little while ago. We all feel very much the same way. You know, quoting from your own analysis, you wrote, quote, redistricting the Wellington Chase students, currently 41 active students, would not have a significant effect on reducing the enrollment at Odell Elementary. Now, I've made copies of the other questions I have, and in case we're out of time, I'll leave them in case you would care to look at, over them. But a number of the things that I question is, why is this decision being rushed? It, it may not seem like it's a fly-by-night decision for you, but it does for us who just really found out about it about a week ago. Uh, the argument stated in your, uh, that was posted on the line about daycare and after-school activities, to me doesn't hold a lot of water, frankly, because um, parents who are going to arrange those activities are going to do it regardless of which school their child is going to attend. And the organizations that provide bus transportation already serve all of those schools. That is really a non-issue. And why were the parents not informed any sooner when the issues that the board realized overcrowding was coming? 
you know, I've lived here for five years, and in the five years I've lived here, only one new subdivision has been opened up. Uh, when my wife and I looked at homes here, all the same active subdivisions were active with full plots five years ago. Where is that advanced plan? Where is that plan that talks about where we're going to be in three to five years? And why can't we have that in place before we move on and try to redistrict this number of students that, as many of the earlier parents have suggested, uh, will only lead to the same problem with the schools we're moving them to? We don't want to see the redistricting happen again and again and affecting our children sometimes more than once. Please look out for the best interests of our children. That's what we're asking you to do. That's what we're here doing. Please don't rubber stamp this tonight and give us some transparency to what you're doing. Thank you again for this hearing and your time. Thank you, Mr. Hyatt, for being here. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Miss Kimberly Siemens. Uh, she's a Cox Mill parent. If you will just tell us your, where, you, where you're from. Hi, uh, again, my name is Kimberly Siemens. I'm a parent of two Cox Mill Elementary students. We live on Alta Crest Drive in the Twin Creek subdivision. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the board regarding the proposal to redistrict my neighborhood. I realize the board has a difficult uh, situation to resolve, and I respect the work that you do to ensure that our children have the best educational opportunities available. While I don't envy your decision that you have to make tonight, I am here to express my concern and to question the necessity of redistricting all the homes to the east of Doretta Road. While the address of each of the 139 students in the proposal has not been made public yet, we've estimated that less than 20 of those students live in, our, in the neighborhoods north of the Rocky River. That means the vast majority of these students in the proposal area live south of the river. I've heard no compelling argument to include these neighborhoods north of the river and caution that the inclusion of these neighborhoods in the redistricting has far more losses than could ever be gained by moving less than 20 students. No new homes are being built in these subdivisions, so we're not contributing to any overcrowding issue. There are, these are established neighborhoods. We bought our homes to put down roots and become part of our community. We will not be moving on because a lease expires. We're permanent neighbors whose children have made lifelong friends in their school. Carl Fur Elementary School is four miles from our home with an interstate in between. I can see the lights of Cox Mill from my house and can hear the activity and the school spirit. So instead of telling our children they can't be part of that within our own community, please consider adjusting the line to include only the areas south of the Rocky River. If it is ultimately your decision to keep our neighborhood within the redistricting, I strongly urge you to begin preparations for the day when Cox Mill High School will be over capacity so we're not again in a situation where we're scrambling to find a temporary solution until action can be taken. Thank you for listening and for considering all of the costs against the benefit of moving so few students. Thank you, Ms. Siemens, for your comments. Our next speaker is uh, Randy Pruitt, another Odell parent. Is Randy <coughs> Pruitt here? Okay. Hearing he's not here, she's not here. Our next speaker is Andrew Phipps, an Odell parent. I see Andrew coming, so we're waiting on you when you get here. Hi. I would also like to thank you for the chance to uh, hear our opinions. I live in the Hamilton Crest uh, neighborhood, which is up by River Ridge in the northwest uh, part of the county. We have two children at Odell, a uh, son in second grade and a daughter in kindergarten. And uh, I agree with, I mean, I'm really just going to echo a number of the, the sentiments uh, already offered, but I think it's important to hear uh, you know, the fact that there's a lot of alignment in our opinions and concern over this matter. Um, it is pretty hard to, to better Lani on, on stating the importance of continuity, but I will, I will add one extra point. Um, my wife is a teacher, and she managed to uh, find a nice opportunity to teach at a private school in the area after both our uh, son and daughter had started at Odell. And we were so pleased with the program and their success and the friends that they had made that we actually, you know, despite it being within our means, uh, we even had a nice discount, did not choose to put our children in the private program. Uh, I'm a big supporter of public schools, and, you know, it really just speaks for us personally the importance of the continuity of friendship in a school and, and, and the points already made. So um, it's been a great experience. We would like to continue it, and I think, as others have stated, we understand, uh, you know, the need for change. But um, I think that transparency around the longer-term 
plan and whether it's phased or all at once or through the building of a new school if we could see the longer term plan and the process and some of us had to make some concessions we'd be willing to do that but but we have to see that it's worth it in the long term um, I think that uh, having options to ease the burden would be great and we would support personally we would support either captain Rollman or grandfathering with an option to provide transportation and I think um, <clears throat> my last suggestion is really around process to ease I can speak to the uh, the comment that David made around you know having a week to be here uh, you know a lot of times I travel and it, it's difficult to, to be able to weigh in with short notice so I think a little better advance notice and maybe some get creative in how we can do some of this um, I'm sure this is you know a time-consuming night for everyone uh, you know we constantly have to fill out forms and get money back in and the teachers are really regimented about doing that and if we could put together a few surveys either administers online or through the paperwork that the teachers disseminate uh, I think it would be very valuable to understand I mean maybe you don't have to consider grandfathering if two people out of 250 were interested but if you find that 200 out of 250 were interested then maybe you take very serious consideration on on some of those options so I think better data better forward-looking planning and you might find a little better support for some of the hard changes we have to make so all right thank you thank you mr. Phelps for being here for your comments our next speaker is Marnie Cummings a no tail Odell for, I guess you're speaking for the PTA no, no I'm not actually you speaking it for a, as a parent <laughs> yes okay parent. you got three minutes okay okay That's, thank I you don't Ms. Cummings. That. okay thank you but um, I was actually hoping to get out of this tonight but I'm still speaking and you'll see why when I get there my name is Marnie Cummings and my family and I live in Pelham Point we currently have a fourth grader at Odell I'm here tonight just to give a rising voice to give a voice to rising fifth graders I've seen online that the issue of grandfathering will be addressed and inquired before speaking tonight I really was trying to get out of it but I was told that it's still strictly the board's decision and there is no way to predict whether the board will consider grandfathering this time if the rezoning has to happen then I urge the board to please grandfather in our rising fifth graders going from elementary to middle school is one of if not the biggest transitions that current that students encounter I feel strongly that it would be a mistake to not grandfather in rising fifth graders fifth grade is a time of celebration and graduation it's also a critical period of growth and stress <coughs> kids find comfort and consistency among familiar faces with the same friends and peers that they will move into middle school alongside if you do not move if you do move forward with this proposed rezoning please grandfather in our rising fifth graders thank you very much miss Cummins you did very good I'd like to get out of this myself <laughs> Okay. All right. Moving along with our next speaker, that will be uh, Aaron Steelwell, a Nodale parent, and, and Aaron's coming, so we'll be waiting to hear from you. And I once again, am pretty much going to reiterate what has already been stated. I live in the River Ridge subdivision as well. Thank you for holding this meeting and even allowing our voices to be heard regarding the proposal to redistrict. For that, I am extremely grateful. I understand that each and every one of you has a vested interest in the well-being of our children and their education and it's for this very reason that I strongly urge you to reevaluate the recommendation of moving 117 children from Odell to Boger Elementary I encourage each board member to personally drive the roads of the proposed redistricting to obtain a clear and accurate picture of the region specifically the area located off of highway 3 and Davidson Road is a static unchanging landscape seems to be pretty common around here no new subdivisions are, are uh, proposed yet this mature land is the targeted corridor in which our 32 children are being played as pawns in this growth game it is recommended that 117 students from the Odell family move to Bogra Elementary the numbers do not add up based on the summary analysis provided to the board Boger Elementary is built to hold 924 students at full operating capacity currently Boger has 788 students enrolled moving the 117 students from Odell to Boger in 2013 would place Boger's enrollment at 905 this leaves only 19 empty seats 
These seats will be taken and used in excess by the 84 students expected in the new and active subdivisions of Trinity Crest, Pine Creek, and Afton Ridge Apartments. This does not even include that expansive uh, subdivision of Kellswater, which will also include two apartment complexes as well as 516 homes. In summary, Boger will begin the 2013 year well over capacity. Quite simply, 117 Odell students are being used as pawns to move one area of overcrowding to another. Is this problem solving or simply problem shifting? I argue this problem shifting is occurring at the expense of our children's educational well-being. The elementary school years are what establish a solid foundation of community, belonging, and stability. These students will be robbed of that opportunity if they are uprooted for the sole purpose of shifting one crowded, over crowded population to another. The 32 children you are proposing to redistrict from the Davidson Road area and Highway 3 corridor are not the source of the increased population growth. I ask you to please reconsider using them as a one-year band-aid to fix the greater long-term need. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steelwell, for your comments. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we need to move on. The, our next speaker is Fries Luigarde. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay. Undoubtedly, Fries is not here. So our next speaker will be Ramona Sunder, a Cox Mill parent. Not here. Okay. Nanette Costes. I think Nanette's coming to the podium. Thank you for being here. Thank you, too. Good evening, everyone, to the board. Um, my name is Nanette Costas. I'm the mother of Patricia Costas. She is currently a fourth grader at Cox Mill Elementary. We relocated here about two and a half years ago at North Carolina, and we are very happy with our move, primarily because of the education that my daughter had for the last two and a half years. Our decision to live nearby is primarily because of the proximity at the school. We're about less than a mile away from Cox Mill, and to be moved to Fur, which is about four miles, and to Bogar, about 10 miles, please do consider that. Um, I will not be going through the details of my questions because all the other parents, when I've heard, they've already raised that. All the planning questions, forecasting, how we model you know, our schools and the capacity for both Cox Mill Elementary and High School, they've all raised it up. I think I'm going to also plea as what Ms. Cummings mentioned. My daughter is also a fourth grader. I hope you will also consider grandfathering her and all the other fourth grader students that will be affected and impacted by the redistricting. That way they will be able to enjoy the last, day, the last year of their school at Cox Mill. And please consider that you know, moving them or moving my daughter will also displace us. So we're hoping that that will be considered during the decision process. Again, thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Costes. Thank you. Our next speaker is Richard Costes. Is Richard here? I'm actually representing him as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. All right. We'll move on to uh, Dr. Jonathan Zambecki. Thank you for being here. And I Hello. think you're going to be... Uh, speaking for the families, you got five minutes, is that right, for a group? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. And I live on, in the enclave on, off of Jim Johnson. Um, <clears throat> I guess you know, th this is sort of a hot button topic for us because we've <clears throat> embedded in Jim Johnson areas multi generational families who've gone to Odell, Miss Laney being one of them. And <clears throat> I think we've seen this coming for the last several years, um, and really the recession's been the only hiccup that's really slowed down the growth. I mean, I, I remember talking to uh, Mr. Klutz five years ago about, you know, possible solutions for the overcrowding that was coming. Um, and we, you know, I, I even have been trying to help find property in that, you know, the North Odell area. Um, but I think our position is that for us, <clears throat> we feel like instead of cherry picking the community vertically, we should look at another idea and work from a horizontal standpoint and 
make this affect the uh, the high density areas that 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 cause the issue. Um, you know the the spot annexation by by Canapolis has really caused this problem, <clears throat> and we've as a group gone to multiple planning and zoning meetings with them and asked them not to rezone some of these developments. And you know Castle Brook being one, we attended their meeting last month <clears throat> and asked them not to rezone it from. Uh, residential estate to residential village, <clears throat> and they pretty much laughed at us. You know, they said basically, <clears throat> it's their they need to make the they make the decisions, and the county has to provide the services that go along with it. And so I think that's you know sort of raised the ire of our our little area with so many of us you know having deep roots there. Me not being one of them, I I develop, helped develop the enclave. And that's where Mr. Klutz and I met because we were trying to help find a solution for what we knew was coming. So my suggestion is <clears throat> to work off the 73 corridor and to take Cabarrus Crossing, Pelham Point, Wellington Chase, and make that the dividing line. And if we're going to have to move students, which the, the, the growth is inevitable, there, you know, we know there are over 1,500 lots out there with permits pulled. <clears throat> then if we use that as our dividing line, we can send enough students over to, <clears throat> to Boger from there. And then when we get the community-based, the additional elementary and middle school um, built, which I'm supposing will have to go north of the 73 line anyway because of the density and the availability of land, then at that point we can reevaluate the need between Odell and the new elementary school, the new middle school. And that way, using that line as a divider, we can look at both sides of the road and say, okay, how many, you know, where's Odell at this point? Where's the new school going to be? We can make our projections off of that and adjust accordingly there. I think that makes a little more sense than cherry picking all the way up in the, the northern part of the county, all the way out to Ship Rock and, you know, River Ridge and, and <clears throat> basically up and down Odell School Road and and, and Jim Johnson when we can make a, a clear delineation and most of the high density occurs right along that 73 corridor. Um, to me that makes a little bit more of a workable situation logistically and, um, and so that's, that's my proposal. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Thank you for your, Thank you. your talk to us. Okay, our next speaker and I believe this will be our last speaker, according to uh, uh, Miss Donna in the back. She said that 24 and 25 decided they wanted to listen instead of speak. So our next speaker and our last speaker will be Nikki Day. And is Nikki here? Here she comes. Okay. Miss Day, you're speaking as a parent, is that correct? Yes. Okay. You have three minutes, and when you get ready, we're ready. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, good evening, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm coming before you on behalf of my daughter, who attends Cox Mill Elementary School as a first grader. Um, we live at Bexley Square at Concord Mills on Lily Green Court, where we have lived for the last four years. Um, I chose this particular apartment community four years ago because I wanted my daughter to attend Cox Mill Elementary School. As a single mother, I could not afford to purchase a house within the Cox Mill School District, but I wanted to uh, give my daughter the opportunity to attend one of the best schools in the county. Um, by moving her to Fur, she will no longer have that opportunity. Our family is very much a part of the community that surrounds Cox Mill. Yes, we have friends that live in our apartment complex, but the 90% of our friends live outside of the apartment complex. They live in Highland Creek, Winding Walk, and Skybrook. My daughter attends preschool with these friends. She now attends school with these same friends. She takes music lessons with them. She goes to dance class with them. She plays t-ball with them. She goes to the games on Friday nights with them. She is very much a part of the community that surrounds Cox Mill. If she was here tonight, she would tell you she loves Cox Mill and she has built lasting friendships and relationships with both school personnel and the kids that go there. As a Cabarrus County School employee, I made the choice not to bring my child with me to school across town. I wanted her to attend her neighborhood school to be able to see what it was like as I did growing up to be able to walk to school if, if she had to and know what it's like to live close to your school. If I didn't want her to stay in her neighborhood I would have just brought her with me. 
By sending my daughter to FUR, you in essence are taking away both a top-notch education and the sense of community. She will no longer feel a part of Cox Mill community. Is it fair to send her to a school that's further away? I don't think so. Tell me how am I supposed to explain that to a six-year-old? How am I supposed to explain that she can no longer go to school with those friends that she sees on a daily basis? How can I tell her she can't attend the school that we drive by every single day? Not only would this, what I've said before, but the impact of this change on my family in particular would be extremely hard. Not only would she no longer attend her neighborhood school, but also this change would impact our daily lives. Because I am a single working parent, I am solely responsible for making sure my child gets to school. She would have to get up even earlier because the school she will be attending is further away. And because I work, she cannot ride the bus. This change will also make her day much longer because she will have to attend Kids Plus or some other after school care until I can pick her up because Fur gets out much earlier than Cox Mill. I want to know what is the school board's plan for long-term growth in this area. This area is continually growing and moving, and moving 139 children next year is not going to change that fact. So what happens in the year 2014-15 when Cox Mill is overcrowded again? Is the board planning to move more students, build a new school? Then what kinds of impact will that have on my child? Will she then be sent to another school because the lines are going to be drawn, redrawn again? I truly understand the dilemma that the school board is under. Cox Mill is overcrowded, but this particular solution is only putting a Band-Aid on a bigger problem. Is the board's plan to move these 139 children and then continue to allow more children to register at Cox Mill? What happens when those families who live in my apartment complex can afford to move across the lawn into a house? Has the board thought of that and that impact? <laughs> For Excuse some me. families living in my apartment complex, it's a stepping stone to a house in Cox Mill. Excuse for me, others, Ms. Day, your time. I'm sorry. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, you went a little bit over, but I was generous with the time because we had something that wasn't here. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Thank you for being here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to give you all a round of applause because you did it. I really appreciate the way you conducted yourself, everyone, because I have been in some public hearings where that uh, I'm glad I was out there instead of up here. But you've all handled yourself very professionally, and I, for one, appreciate that, and I know the board does as well. Okay, board members, we need to move on to 4.3, which that is the call for the motion to close the public hearing. Do I have such a motion? I have a motion. Have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, the public hearing is, there, is now closed out. Okay, now we're going to move to the recognitions portion of the agenda. And just so that, the, so that you know that those of you that are here and are waiting, you know, we do have the action agenda that will be coming up, and we'll get to that just as quickly as we can. So right now we're going to do the Impact Through Education Awards, and Miss Ronnie Boone will be coming to the podium. And I hope all of you were here when I made the announcement about the Impact Through Education Awards that you'll, when your name is called, come to the front. And uh, Mr. Uh, Martin wants to get a picture of you, and the board wants to congratulate you and all that. So anyway, uh, Ms. Boone, when you get ready for the, these awards, we're ready to go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, board members. Good evening, audience members. Tonight, for our Impact Through Education Awards, we will be honoring students and staff at C.C. Griffin Middle School and R. Brown McAllister Elementary School. We're going to begin tonight with C.C. Griffin Middle School, and at this time I'd like to invite any members of the C.C. Griffin administrative team to please come forward to stand with their students and staff. And if I could just get you guys to stand right on that green tape right there. Our first honoree from C.C. Griffin is Carson Smith. Would Carson and her family please come forward? Come on up. Mom, Dad, everybody. <laughs> Carson.
Carson Smith is an eighth grade student who always makes the honor roll and whose favorite subject is science. Her love of music is shown by participating in the school chorus. Not only does she have musical talent, but athletic talent as well. Last year, she was a member of both the track and basketball teams. She also contributes to CC Griffin through her involvement with Odyssey of the Mind and Chess Club. Carson has a younger sister in sixth grade and sometimes finds herself in the protective big sister role. She occasionally works as a babysitter in the community. Her career goals include becoming a physical therapist or an architect. She surrounds herself with positive peers and her teachers say, her teachers say Carson demonstrates positive character traits and serves as a role model for others. Trustworthy, ambitious, and always willing to help others are just a few of the notable traits she demonstrates. Her talent and ambition can also be observed through her appearance as a movie extra in The Hunger Games. <laughs> Opportunities abound at C.C. Griffin Middle School to observe Carson's acts of kindness toward others, her tremendous work ethic, and her desire to learn. Congratulations, Carson. Our next C.C. Griffin honorees are actually two members of the same family. So at this time, I'd like to invite Jesse Willard and Ms. Jessica Willard and their families to please come forward. And I'm going to read Jesse's bio first and then his mother's bio. Jesse Willard is an eighth grade student who excels in academics and service to his school and community. He always makes the honor roll and is expected to make all A's by his parents. His favorite subjects are math and science. Jesse's school spirit and work ethic is demonstrated through his participation in school sports, including basketball, baseball, and football. He is also involved in Biomoto and Chess Club. In the past, Jesse's desire to help others has been shown through working as an office and media assistant, although his helpfulness does not stop there. He spends many hours before and after school helping with whatever may be needed by the staff at C.C. Griffin. He somehow manages all of this at school and still has time to play on a community baseball team that travels to many different states. He has a five-year-old five -year brother whom he describes as one of his best friends. His career goal is to be a professional baseball player, but he's also interested in engineering and firefighting. When asked about Jesse, his teachers had nothing but positive things to say, including that he was dependable, willing, and thoughtful. As Jesse continuously shares these qualities with others, it is clear to see his positive impact on education. Congratulations, Jesse, on receiving the Impact Through Education Award for C.C. Griffin Middle School. <laughs> now for his, his mother's uh, accolades. Jessica Willard, wife of Donnie, a mother of Jesse and DJ, serves as the front office receptionist for C.C. Griffin Middle School. Jessica came to the United States from Guatemala in 1996, speaking no English at all. Her, perse her perseverance to learn the English language, the value she places on education, and her natural gifts of patience, kindness, and helpfulness allow her to be outstanding in her work. Jessica's smiling face has literally and figuratively opened doors to many families that would otherwise not feel comfortable entering the school building or communicating with school personnel. She has an uncanny ability to multitask, and she approaches every task with a whatever-it-takes-to-do-the-job-well attitude. 
Even though Jessica's primary role is carried out in the main office area, she, has, she is a significant part of the overall success of the school. She has even been known to serve as the secret weapon on the C.C. Griffin Middle School staff basketball team. <laughs> Whether shooting jump shots from the perimeter, working with the PTO on various events, or assisting parents, students, or staff with anything and everything, it is clear that C.C. Griffin Middle School is extremely lucky to have Jessica Woolard as a part of its family. Congratulations, Mrs. Woolard, on receiving the Impact Through Education Award. And our final honoree tonight from C.C. Griffin Middle School is Mr. Tom Ellsworth. Would Mr. Ellsworth and his family please come forward? Tom Ellsworth is the, the husband of Kelly and father to Elena, Peter, and Isaac. He serves as a seventh grade science teacher at C.C. Griffin Middle School. Mr. Ellsworth is the school's leadership team chairperson and is the champion of innovative thinking in the school. For the second year in a row, he is the only male on an otherwise all-female seventh grade staff. <laughs> Along with the patience required to be effective with his work wives, he is a mentor for many of the challenging male students in the seventh grade. Mr. Ellsworth has brought attention to the positive learning outcomes associated with the game of chess, and he serves as the school's chess club sponsor. Through his work with this group, he has attracted students from all walks of life and convinced them of their ability to learn and apply the strategies needed for successful chess play. Mr. Ellsworth makes great connections with his students, takes advantage of teachable moments, and provides learning opportunities that allow students to enjoy the experience. He is a reflective teacher and is always looking for opportunities to learn and grow. He's, he recently took on the role of science teacher leader within the district's Common Core Steering Committee. Outside of school, Mr. Ellsworth is an active member of Grace Pres Presbyterian Church in Harrisburg, where he serves as the youth ministry director. His love of learning, compassion for others, and the desire to make a true difference in, the, in this world allow him to serve as a moral compass for many on the C.C. Griffin campus. Congratulations, Mr. Ellsworth. Next up for our Impact Through Education Awards are students and staff from R. Brown McAllister Elementary School. And I'd like to invite the administrative team or the administrator from R. Brown, R. Brown McAllister to please come forward. <laughs> You're not a team, I'm sorry. <laughs> our first honoree from R. Brown this evening is Kelsey Hall. Would Kelsey and her family please come forward? Kelsey Hall is a hardworking fourth grade student who always goes out of her way to be kind and helpful to other students with no questions asked. 
Kelsey's giving character is perhaps best summarized by the following incident. Last month, a kindergarten child dropped his tray in the cafeteria, and Kelsey immediately got up to help him. She not only assisted him with picking up food from the floor, she also took time to see that he was okay. In the classroom, Kelsey always seeks opportunities to assist her teacher, Mrs. Bassett. She serves as a classroom leader and does an excellent job managing and keeping her science group on task. Kelsey never seeks approval. Instead, she feels compelled to help people out of the kindness of her heart. Thank you, Kelsey, for making an impact and a difference at R. Brown McAllister and for being a role model to others. Our next R. Brown McAllister honoree is Dorian Williams. Would Dorian and his family please come forward? Fifth grader Dorian Williams never ceases to be mannerly and polite to both peers and adults. Dorian may appear shy and quiet, but these qualities make him mesh in with the crowd. But if you have the opportunity to hold a conversation with him, he will bring you into a well-educated, well-versed dialogue. You may have to stop and remember that you're talking to a 10-year-old and not an adult. Dorian is also kind and compassionate to all. As part of a project for Mrs. Shakespeare's class, he has volunteered to work with a kindergarten student with special needs. Dorian's generosity and giving spirit have helped the kindergartner feel both more comfortable in and more a part of the school environment. In addition to his citizenship qualities, he happens to be a star student. He constantly puts forth hard work and solid effort no matter what the task. Dorian, we are proud of you and thank you for making an impact on the lives of all those at R. Brown McAllister. Our next honoree from R. Brown McAllister Elementary School is Mrs. Suzanne Schaefer. Would Mrs. Schaefer and her family please come forward? A smiling face and comforting words are what you are greeted with when stepping into R. Brown McAllister's Media Center. On a shoestring budget, Mrs. Schaefer keeps the library inviting to students. She matches and connects children to an outside world of wonder through books. She inspires and encourages all students, and in doing so, makes a positive and lasting difference in their lives. She combines a passion for reading with curiosity. She can spot and grasp a teachable moment despite what plans have been prepared for that day. Mrs. Schaefer also has a nat natural gift for selfless service. In addition to supporting all classroom teachers, she leads the school in its implementation of the Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports, or PBIS, program. She also is the school representative for the Young Authors Project and the coach for Battle of the Books. Overall, Mrs. Schaefer is a strong advocate for literacy. 
At R. Brown McAllister, Suzanne Schaefer makes a difference every day, and we are proud to name her as an Impact Through Education Award recipient. Congratulations. And our final honoree from R. Brown McAllister Elementary School this evening is Mrs. Brenda Kerner. Would Mrs. Kerner and her family please come forward? R. Brown McAllister's Brenda Kerner serves as the school's treasurer in title, but in fact, Brenda wears many hats in her role. While not busy keeping finances and budgets in order, and even when busy, she takes the initiative to make the school a better place for all. A prime example of Brenda's giving character took place this past summer. Recognizing that the newly installed school garden was in bad need of weeding, she took, to the, task, she took the task on and, turned, and turned out on what turned out to be one of the hottest days of the year. After weeding, Brenda graciously laid a large pile of mulch in the garden bed. In addition to being an outstanding treasurer, Brenda takes the time to look out for others, whether her fellow staff or students. When an employee of the school was admitted to the hospital, she made a point to visit her, even though it was after school hours. To top it off, Brenda offered to provide a ride home to her colleague once she was discharged. These are just two tremendous acts of kindness and giving that define Brenda's character. Day to day, if Brenda notices a need, she effortlessly jumps right in to see what needs to, what needs to be done. She sets an example for our Brown students and even reminds her adult colleagues that no matter how preoccupied they are with their immediate responsibilities, serving others for the good of the whole is what matters most. Congratulations, and thank you for making an impact at R. Brown McAllister. Thank you, Ms. Boone. Uh, right, we've got one more recognition that's going to be coming up here. We have Ms. Kathy Auger and Dr. Shepard coming down, and we also have uh, Mr. Tom Dunlap, the sales manager from up at uh, Hillbush Ford, to make the Hillbush Ford Teacher of the Month Award. And so, Ms. Auger, when you're ready, and Mr. Vaughn, uh, no, Mr. Vaughn's not here, it's Mr. Tom Dunlap. And so when he gets here, we're ready to give this awardee their presentation. Thank you. Good evening. Once again this month, thanks to the generosity of Hillbish Ford, Cabarrus County Schools recognizes an outstanding teacher. Tonight we are pleased to have Mr. Thomas Dunlap, sales manager for Hillbish Ford with us to present this award. The Cabarrus County Schools Hillbish Ford Teacher of the Month for October 2012 is Liza Short. And Ms. Short, would you and your family and any members of the school administrative team please come forward? <laughs> Lisa Short is a fourth grade teacher at Carl A. Fur Elementary School. She was nominated for this award by one of her students' parents. In the nomination, the parent wrote, 
This is Mrs. Short's first year in Cabarrus County, and she has already made a dramatic difference in my son's attitude towards school. He's an AIG student who has trouble understanding why he has to keep doing things that he's already mastered. He's had wonderful teachers every year, but suddenly he's coming home singing every day after school. He even gets up without too much trouble. Considering we're one of the early start elementary schools, that's a miracle all by itself. <laughs> I don't know how she's done it, but Mrs. Short has truly caught his interest and kept it. Every child that I have seen who is in her class is completely happy this year, and so are the parents I have spoken to. My son loves going to school every day. He does his homework and even seems to enjoy it. I feel like a miracle has taken place and Mrs. Short is responsible for it. Mrs. Short, please accept our congratulations and our thanks for all you do each day to inspire your students. We're honored to have you as a part of the Cabarrus County Schools family. Um, if you'd join me in a round of applause. For Mrs. <laughs> And at this time, Mr. Dunlap and Dr. Shepard are presenting you with a few tokens of appreciation. And before you're seated, if you'll allow our board members to please shake your hands and congratulate you individually. Thank you. Okay, that, that concludes our recognitions part. We thank Hilbish Ford for their continued participation in this. Not only they do this for Cabarrus County Schools monthly, but they do this for Canapa City Schools monthly, I believe, as well. And just so that you'll know, on the Impact Through Education Awards, uh, Miss Boone, Miss Ronnie Boone, that did the presentations earlier, she would love to talk to any of you or anyone that's viewing this about sponsorship for the Impact Through Education Awards. And uh, so anyway, be thinking about that. Just throw that in for that. And uh, so anyway, we need to move on, board members, to 6.0, 6.1, the approval of the minutes from our September the 10th work session, our September the 17th business meeting. Do I have a motion that the minutes will be approved as presented? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Motion carries. 6.0, minutes approved. Okay, now we move on to 7.0, which is the report section for the board chair, and then 7.2 will be superintendent. I don't have but just a couple of things that I want to say, and it's primarily pertaining to the redistricting, the public hearing that we've had, and just, just for maybe a minute or two, uh, just want you to know that I know from my own experience, because I've set my little grandson, he's nine years old, and he's done moved around two or three different times, I don't like to see that, but I've one, learned one thing, though, just for whatever it's worth, and that, believe it or not, the, the young ones, the children, they adapt to the move a whole lot easier than we as parents and grandparents do. Now, I have learned that. It's never easy, and I, I remember watching him when he would go to a different school for whatever reason it might have been because his parents moved from Texas to North Carolina or from Concord to Mount Pleasant, that type thing, that uh, he says, Paul, Paul, he says, I really... I'm a little bit anxious about going to school today. And so I, I know how that is, parents. I want you to know that, and I feel that your, your pain, your emotions, you know, I feel that. And, uh, you know, for the board members that's had children and grandchildren, you know, the move, it's not always an easy thing. And as I said earlier, um, it's a tough decision. And everybody knows without question that the schools are overcrowding. The growth is there. It's going to probably get a whole lot worse before it gets any better. And so everybody knows it's there, but nobody wants to move. And we know, realistically, that there's going to have to be some changes and there'll have to be some moves. And so, you know, I just wanted to say that for that, whatever that's worth. And Dr. Shepard, you have some comments that you have scheduled here. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and can, if I can just add to your words, I, I want to thank Dr. Sane, uh, who has put a lot of thought 
in preparation and made a wonderful presentation last week and uh, and um, I, I think has tried to feel the pain of the families that, that are going to be asked to move somewhere else and this is uh, her first attempt at, at, uh, at redistricting and I know it's the hardest thing that I've asked her to do as associate superintendent so thank you very much I appreciate your hard work And I want to say to the parents that, uh, that regardless of which children move from Cox Mill and Odell to where our vac vacant seats are, and largely they're at Fur and they're at Boger, that uh, we will do all that we can do, whether it's the ones that we've recommended or, or another recommendation that the board wants to, to act on. We will do everything we can to make the transition from one school to the other as smooth as possible. I, I have a young man that I've stayed in touch with that we moved his high school a few years ago, and um, and he has told me on a number of occasions that the principals were, were willing to reach out and make that transition extremely smooth. And I know it's not going to be easy, but I want you to know that we had the responsibility for doing that. And part of that responsibility, I want to say I appreciate tonight that we've got, uh, I, I know Mr. Roberts, we just recognized you, Darren Roberts, who is the principal of FUR here. And uh, I know he'll commit to, to doing that. And you got to see some good things uh, a moment ago that are going on at FUR, for those of you that were concerned about that. We also have with us uh, Allison Moore and Lynn Marsh, who are the principals of, um, of Odell and Cox Mill. And thank you for being here and being supportive of your families and parents. Um, <clears throat> um, just a few other things I want to mention tonight. Um, I'd like to highlight um, just a few things. First, I want to remind the parents of our high school students that now they can access uh, their children's attendance and grades and assignments and demographic information through the Parent Assist Module, or PAM. I hope if you're a high school parent out there that you've taken advantage of that. It's an internet-based tool. We sent home a password and login. Uh, and uh, that will be available to our middle school and elementary students in January. But it's a wonderful way of keeping up with the progress that your children are making. Um, also, a particular interest to our high school parents uh, tonight, the class of 2013 graduation ceremony schedule has now been posted on our district website. So I know that's, that's of interest to uh, our seniors and others. So please, uh, please look at that. Uh, also, our fall parent webinar series um, online is continuing. Uh, programs focus on improving uh, academic success, raising healthy and responsible students, uh, special populations, and family leadership. Now, this year, uh, we're covering the uh, positive behavior program that Ms. Boone mentioned a while ago, as well as uh, uh, what we can do to fight substance abuse and uh, to provide stress management for our parents. And some future topics that we'll focus on soon will be our parent-teacher conferences, uh, our gifted children and what we do for them, and uh, the childhood depression. So um, those webinars are available online. You can sign up or you can go back and visit them after they've already occurred. But we found them to be very helpful, and I want to thank Mr. John Basilis and others who are making that available for our parents. Um, also, I want to congratulate one of our schools tonight, Weinkoff Elementary School art teacher Amy Mills was recently named the North Carolina Elementary Art Education Art Educator of the Year by the North Carolina Art Education Association. That's a tremendous honor, and we look forward to honoring her uh, personally in the future here at one of these meetings. Uh, as a reminder to our view viewing audience, you can learn more about the great work that's happening in our school system by visiting our website or any of our social media sites. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Shepard, for your comments. And Okay, board members, we need to move on now to 8.1, which is the approval of the consent agenda. These are the items that we discussed in our work session and all had uh, uh, consensus that we would put them on the um, consent agenda. So do I have a motion <coughs> that the consent agenda be approved as presented? I have a motion and I have a second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 6 0 on the consent agenda items. All right, now we're down to the action agenda. I'd like to ask Dr. Colleen Sane to the podium, and she's going to be talking with us and going over again the proposed uh, redistricting plan. I'm sure she made good notes and got all your answers. i tell you what we need to do before you get started, Colleen. Can we get the camera crew? Can you go ahead and do your change over now? Is it too early to do that, or can you go ahead and do that now? You going to do that now? All right, well, you give me the okay when we're ready to start back. 